Welcome to the conversation. On today's program, we continue with our assessment of Jamaica debates, the budget debate 2024. And for this aspect of the program, I'll be speaking with the opposition spokesperson on commerce, technology, and information, Dr. Andre Harton. He's also a senior lecturer and an economist. Welcome to the conversation. <laughs> Welcome. Right? Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. And my so, portfolio is science, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. No commerce. No commerce. It, it was commerce prior, but what we did was to dichotomize that. So now Tony Hilton deals with commerce and I deal with the overall innovation and how the fourth industrial revolution will impact us. Fourth industrial revolution. <laughs> All right, interesting. Um, so we have been looking at the, the budget debates over the past few days. Um, we started with um, Minister Clark's own, then we went to the leader of the opposition, Mark Golden, and we looked at the Prime Minister's own as well. What are your assessments, um, beginning with the, the Minister of Finance's own, and then we come right down? What's your assessment of his Yeah, presentation? I mean, the Minister of Finance, he came out as usual. You know, the country is preparing for election mode. So a lot of the plans, a lot of the suggestions are going to be things that they think are going to lower people to uh, have more confidence in them. Uh, overall, my thoughts of the budget was that it, it's not as substantial as it ought to be. I mean, there are a little bit of tricks of nuggets being dropped here and there. I mean, the expansion of the threshold to 1.7, the increase of the threshold for pensioners, mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. But when you realize and you look deep into these plans, there are nothing really substantial that is going to move a nation of such remarkable people forward. So, so that's your assessment as, as the economist or as the, 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 the opposition spokesman? All right, that's my assessment as both. Mm -hmm. And why do I say that? Take the 1.7, for example, moving the, moving the needle from 1.5 to 1.7, 200,000 extra per annum. That's going mm -hmm. to work out to about 4,000. Per, yes. per month, which is $1,000 per week yeah. extra per person who earns on that threshold. Now, what value is $1,000? $1,000, you can buy extra lunch per day, but it's nothing substantial that can allow you to save and create wealth. And that is the problem that Jamaica faces because when you talk about average income, average income in the country is about $5,000, $6,000 $6, now. In order for us to be considered a I developed 7, nation, 7,000 purchasing power parity. Yeah. In order for us to be considered a developed nation, we need to arrive at 13,000 US dollars average income per person. And what does it take for us to achieve this? We have to look at the industries that we've been focusing on. We have to look at how we have been preparing labor for these industries. And we have to look at how we are going to equip labor with the necessary knowledge and expertise in order for them to earn higher value income. And that is what I expected from the Ministry of Finance. I expected them to look at the productivity issues across different industries, look at how we have been employing labor, and to see how best now we can move this labor up the value chain. So, and that, to me, would have been more substantial. So what are some of those deficiencies that you talk about, though, in terms of productivity and so on? What All are right. some of those? Fundamentally, across the length and breadth of Jamaica, we have different industries. You have the financial sector industry, you have housing, you have education, you have uh, mining, you have different industries. Now, within these industries come different players who are employed. Now, what we have been seeing is that the jobs that have been created in Jamaica over the last eight years, over the last, say, seven, six years, are low-paying jobs. So we, we have inextricably a low-wage economy where the majority of the people who work earn below a particular threshold. And this is why the government has always have to come with little nuggets here and there in order to bribe them because we don't have anything substantial being put forward to enhance these people's ability to earn more. All right. What would have been a better, a better, a better, a better proposition than to to the people of Jamaica in terms of moving us, as you say, from a low wage economy um, to something more substantial? All right. Think about this, right? The aim is to have people earning higher income. Now, you come and you make a proposition, you're going to give people $1,000 extra per week, right? Because that is what it boils up to, $1,000 extra per week. Now, 
how about looking at our agricultural industry and to see the crops that we can produce at high value? How about looking at post-harvesting of the current crops that we produce? That's just one example to see how we can minimize the 30% post-harvest losses that we have been facing over the last two or three decades so that we can earn more from agriculture. How about looking at how we infuse technology and innovation in agricultural production so that those people who work in that industry can able to produce more and also to fetch higher prices from the more that they produce. And that is just one example. Take the cannabis industry as an example. There are states in America who, from their sale of cannabis, right, and from the market that they establish for cannabis, are giving back tax rebates to their citizens. So it's not just taking money out of the budget. It's about allowing the government to mm -hmm furnish industries that have high growth potential, allow these industries to grow, and when these industries grow, they can collect more taxes, and then from the more taxes from these industries, they'll have bigger to redistribute. And this is just one example. Remember, I'm telling you, you have four different goods industries. You, yeah. you have the agricultural industry, mining industry, you have construction industry, financial as and well. so on. And then you have the service industry, which is the financial, the education, the electricity, gas and water, the telecommunications, etc., etc. So each industry requires tailor-made solutions in order to move them forward. And that is what we expected to see when you're talking about moving a nation of, of such remarkable people out of poverty. All right, let's, let's backtrack a little on the and the, the movement of the, the needle, you say, from 1.5 to 1.7. Um, Mark Golden had stated that a better approach would have been to move it from 1.5 to 2, to, mm -hmm. two, to 2 million dollars for the year. And he stated that if they get the opportunity to form the next government, then that's what he would be doing. But he has not stated how he would actually finance that. Everything from the budget is financed in two ways. Mm -hmm. either through collecting taxes or through borrowing. So the government doesn't have a million ways how to finance everything. It's either them collect tax or them borrow. Now, what's fundamental is for us to understand the economic trajectory mm -hmm. that Jamaica has been embarking on over the last 20, the last 15 years. Now, we are moving towards comparing our economies to a Cayman, to a Panama, to a Dominican Republic, to a Bermuda. And what do I mean? We want to establish ourselves as a premier financial hub in the Caribbean, providing financial services, not just to domestic Jamaicans, but also to foreigners who are seeking safe havens in order to store their, their unused capital. Now, in the Cayman Islands, there's no income tax. In Bermuda, there's no income tax. And if you speak to the people at GIFSA, which is Jamaican, um, in, Securities and, and so on commission. They are looking or, or were looking They should still be looking at how the country can move away from Indirect to direct taxation and that is how the modern world has been going on What's indirect taxation? Indirect taxation is when you tax people's income before they actually spend a dollar from it mm -hmm. While direct taxation is the form of consumption tax when you spend they call it the tax directly So you're talking and about higher GCTs and stuff like that? Not necessarily higher GCTs, but the move why you realize the income tax threshold has been moving up little by little little by little is to move away from indirect taxes as a country to, to direct, direct taxes. taxes and one reason is that only 27% of the population pays income tax. The other 73% don't pay. So why do you put that burden on the teachers because you know where their salary is, on the nurses because you know where their salary is, on doctors and other young professionals because but, you can know. But a person but, who but operates a small business uh -huh. or a medium-sized business or any type of business because you cannot find them and find their income you tax your middle class. And that is what has been happening. We have been obliterating our middle class to the extent of our economic progression. No, but the argument can be, can be raised just as well that this is something that predates this particular um, administration. So it's not something that is, that is just 
novel where they are the ones that who have implemented it. We're looking at su successive governments mm -hmm. have sought to maintain mm -hmm. um, the status quo in terms of maintaining the, the, the whole PAYE. They have spoken about reducing it, but we have not seen real, real, real changes until the 1.5 and now the 1.7. Well, we're hoping for the 1.7. Throughout the course of a country's economic life, yeah. business cycles change and your objectives evolve. Now, once upon a time, Jamaica could not envision competing in the global financial sectors to attract capital. But after prudent fiscal management from 2011, 2013, 2014, 2015, and so on, that laid the foundation for us to now embark on what we call a fiscal responsible path, because the fiscal rules that govern how we spend our earnings today were established with the IMF with the Jamaican government back in 2012, 2013, and so on, when prior we could not even get a chance to sign an IMF agreement. Now, what do I mean? Mm -hmm. That fiscal rule lays out where the country plans to go by 2026, by 2030 with the Vision 2030 goals, yeah. and also in the foreseeable future. And the prime among that is how we administer fiscal policy in such a way that it benefits the masses of the people and move Jamaica closer towards being a modern developed nation. So, so you have stated earlier that um, there are one of two ways that you're able to finance a budget. You said taxes or, or loans. Um, and much of the Prime Minister's credit, he has stated that more persons now are willing to invest and they have actually begun to invest in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's primarily one of the areas where we'll be able, um, able to, as a country, finance many of the decisions um, that are coming out of this current Foreign budget. Foreign direct investment mm -hmm. to Jamaica is not new, you know? No, it's not new, but... Foreign um, Jamaica what, has always what been What he has stated is that there is no more. To, it's always been more. Just taking inflation alone into perspective, mm -hmm. it's always been more and more foreign direct investment that has been pouring into Jamaica's coffers. Now, the problem is, and one of my research also showed uh, that the returns that the country ought to have been getting from the inflow of foreign direct investment, we have not been able to do so because of the exploitative nature of much of the foreign direct investment that has been coming to Jamaica. Take the hotel oh, and tourism industry as an example. Lots of Spanish hotels and, and so on and so forth come and they build and develop. But what type of jobs have been provided for the Jamaicans? Mediocre jobs. The higher level management jobs have been held for foreigners. I was having a conversation with someone in, 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 the, in, in the US the other day and they were talking to me about the ports and they were saying that even though foreign investors come and invest in the ports in Miami, it is stipulated by law that they must use United States employment at certain levels of management. And so, those are the things that we want to see when foreign direct investment come to Jamaica. It does not just come and exploit. It mm -hmm. comes and provide opportunities to assist the countries to grow. So, so my question to you then, as it is no, um, are we equipped? Is our labor force equipped to service those particular needs? Is it that we have enough qualified individuals to walk into those roles? No, not we're not talking about that planning it. for the next that five, ten years. That is the problem with Jamaica. No, that's my question. You see, we always believe in the power of no. So somebody is cooking, as soon as the water start boil, they expect the dumplings to be ready. And the dumplings haven't been no, needed no. yet, and they haven't no. been dropped in the pot. And that is the problem. No. We tend to but be myopic in no. our economic orientation no. towards solutions. I love the way you and put it. And we cannot be myopic because the economy mm -hmm. is a ongoing process that transitions through phases. So what you are prepared for in one year your skills can become so redundant. And what we need to realize mm -hmm. is that with the advent of the fourth industrial revolution, yes. with the advent of the internet of things, artificial intelligence, and, generative intelligence and, and so and, on and yeah. so forth, skills and so on are needed to be trained every day. So it's not just you being prepared. There's a lot of people who learn on the job, you know. 
there are a lot of people who leave university with an economics degree. Yeah. And they go to a firm and they work doing even some accountant, doing even TV presentation, and they learn on the job. Because what the university does, as an example, is teach you how, how to, learn. to learn. Yeah. Teach you how to learn. So, and Jamaicans, I'm, and I'm not bragging about us now, come on. All right, go we on. We have the ability above all others to learn. And that is a factor that we have to take into so, consideration. So, so it's not just about having a pool of ready done people mm -hmm. sitting and waiting and say, oh, okay, you're coming, we have 10. It's about recognizing where the future is going and preparing your workforce to meet the future so, when it arrives. So both to your credit as well as to the Prime Minister's credit now, because remember, you know, um, I remember having a discussion just across from here with um, a member of the diaspora who stated that Jamaica has probably one of the highest per capita of PhDs in the world. Look at that. All right, that's one thing on one hand. But then also, um, what we have to pay attention to, we don't want to say, because you're, you're saying that we, we love the power of no, but fact is, you are talking about foreign direct investments that have always been coming in. You know, you, have, you said that, you have stated earlier that it has always been a lot. But based on the exploitative nature of it, then we don't get to reap the benefits that we ought to. My question was, how do we prepare to engineer? Do we have the relevant personnel? No. And what measures can we therefore put in place to ensure that the next time something like that happens, we are ready, we are waiting, and we are able to move into those places because we export a lot of labor? Exactly. And that is the point I was getting to. Mm -hmm. There are Jamaicans with their degrees, with their skills, their heightened skills, working in other countries. And, and doing very well, as well as their Jamaicans with high-level skills working mediocre jobs in other countries. Now, take Singapore as an example. <laughs> and we have to use it as an, as an example, right? right? go on. When Lee Kuan Yew embarked on his plans to make Singapore a developed nation, one of the most fundamental policies was to attract the youngest and the brightest, right? And he did so by providing the right housing for them, provide the right economic atmosphere for them to use their labor in a profound way to contribute towards the development of his country. Now, what, what does Jamaica do? We force the youngest and the brightest to migrate. After we train them, we spend X amount because we subsidize their education and the country subsidize up to 80% of many persons' education. I think that's now down to 75, that's, that, that subsidy is reducing. Purchasing poor party inflation, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, 75%, 70%, 60%, 50%. Mm -hmm. We subsidize a significant portion of it. And who gets the benefit? The United Kingdom, the United States of America, and Canada, whom these people believe that their skills are better served in. So it's not as if we don't have the people. It is the economic enabling environment that we have not created through policy to allow them to remain. And that is why we face such a high brain drain. My book, right. Overcoming Productivity Challenges in Small Countries. Right. Let me hold you on that one, because we have to go to a break, but we'll come back. We're starting right where we left off. Right. You're watching the conversation. We'll be right back. We're speaking with Dr. Andrea Houghton, senior lecturer and economist, as well as a member of the opposition for technology, innovation, innovation and entrepreneurship. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Conversation, where I'm speaking with Dr. Andre Houghton, Opposition Spokesperson on Science, Technology, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Just before the break, we started looking at the differences between um, Singapore and Jamaica. And one of the fundamental differences that, that I myself have observed is that we, our approach to policy are fundamentally different. Singapore is about implementation, to the point where they will say that Policy is implementation, and implementation is policy. Whereas we are full, we are not. We are not short Lip of service. ideas. Well, better you say it. We're not short of ideas, but I see it, it gives the impression that we are not adept at doing the implementations that are necessary. And that's where both the opposition and um, the, the ruling government should come in place, where the opposition holds 
the, 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 the government, you know, to account and informs the people in terms of how we can go about doing that? What are your views there? You see, prudent economic management has to dichotomize the economy as you would look at any body of organs or systems that come together to create a complete whole. Now, as I explained to you before, our book, Overcoming Productivity Challenges in Small Countries, looks at the main factors that contribute to the lack of implementation of which you speak. And prime among them is the whole issue of corruption and mismanagement of public funds. And it might sound cliche in the Jamaican context, but it is very significant. And what did Lee Kuan Yew do when corruption came to his doorsteps? He made an example of his brother-in-law, his family. And with that example, the others that, who followed were very certain that if they stepped out of line, then they would become examples too. And Jamaica, because we have never been short of a budget. And every year you read the budget, there's plans in the budget and funds allocated for different elements of that economic puzzle that we see to be improved. Mm -hmm. But what happens? The leakages that comes through corruption, and I can speak of the Cornwall Regional Hospital as an example. The first time a budget was tabled, the Cornwall Regional Hospital was allocated, I think, three billion, yeah. right, for it to be completed. Now, the Crown Regional Hospital has been allocated 21 billion over how many percentage? But, but hasn't the scope of the work changed? Hasn't that been changed? There is, all right, you know what's a budget? A budget looks at what you need to get something done. Mm -hmm. So even if the scope of the work changed by 25%, by 50%, by 100%, it cannot change by thousands of percent. No, that means the person who did the appraisal in the first place was incorrect. Was nonsense. So, so, what? so we, you get nonsense people to do an appraisal. Then you what? come back and say, oh, it changed by a thousand percent. And the Connor Regional Hospital is just one example. Okay. Essex so, Valley is so, also another example. Every year in the budget, mm -hmm. Essex Valley water this, Essex Valley water that. Yet still there are so many Jamaicans, so but, many farmers still out of so, water. So, so, so my, where is, so where my is my that question, leakage? No. Where are those no, monies going? My question no, um, your role as an economist, one, because um, first and foremost, you're a Jamaican who, who's an economist. And I've always and the, had mm -hmm. the same inclination for national development, whether I am in of or out of politics. So, so because the question, no, you know, we hear about Essex Valley, we hear about the Cornwall Regional Hospital, and we look at, we can just put those aside for a second, and we look at the regular construction industry, where... We grow every year, yes, um, to the tune of probably a maximum of 7%. Mm -hmm. But separate from that, there's always this issue of cost overrun. You start with a budget this year to build your house, and the contractor comes back, and hey, you know, we have a cost overrun, or we by have this, or we have that. 50, by 50%, by 100%. But yeah. By, but by a thousand percent? But wait, no, no, no. That's, that's based on the fact that the that's scope... That's a whole new complex. Yeah, the, the scope that's hasn't not changed, you know. That's you, you envision to exactly. build. So, that's so not an apartment complex so what I'm building asking, for you and the entire cronies. What I'm asking you now, I'm asking you now, so based on the fact that, let's say it's a cost overrun, one, I'm asking whether or not there has been a change in the scope of what Cornwall Regional Hospital was intended to be. So the scope has changed. So because the scope has changed, then the budget necessarily will have to change as By well. By a thousand percent? That I, means I we're, know, we're, it depends on the if scope. It was being, what's the scope? The scope is it must be able to cater to, say, 100,000 people per month. When mm -hmm. you change that to a, a, ten, a thousand dollars, you're saying it's going to cater to a million people no, per month? I'm, I'm what's asking the scope? you. I'm asking what's you. What's the scope? When we, and that is the problem that we've been having mm -hmm. with procurement and with implementation of tasks. National planning and development is not a joke. It is not something that you wake up and you ask your friend tomorrow to tell you how much he thinks the corner regional hospital is going to cost to rehabilitate. 
it takes engineers to yeah. come and assess the situation, look at all the parameters involved, and say, okay, it is going to cost us $3 billion, but if with contingencies, right, it's going to cost us $6 billion, right? Yeah. Now, with those contingencies, okay, you face other on-the-job nuances. So yeah. you say, okay, it's going to cost us not six, but nine billion. But come on, 21, 21. and it's still not completed, a thousand percent more, 1,000 percent. That is how we are showing you that our assessments as a country have been ill-mannered. So my question then is, how can the opposition know, hold this government to task to the extent where they can be better off for it so that when, so that people will feel more comfortable because you are holding them to the fire mm -hmm. now, you know? so that when you become, I think the statement was made in, in, in Mark Golden's speech where he is interested or he is intending to hold the government to task so that the people of Jamaica can see that they are better off to become the government, to form mm -hmm. the next government, what steps are being taken to ensure that something like that we, doesn't we, happen? We, we, we meticulously scrutinize all the documents that we get, and we try as best as possible to bring to the public's attention when we suspect foul play of any sort. And this is what we have been doing. We've been to the Corner Regional Hospital so many times as an example. We've assessed the, the scope of work and so on and so forth. And it is about bringing this to the public for and to allow Jamaicans to realize that the level of corruption that has been taking place over the last eight years has not been normal. Take the Ministry so, of Education, for example, but, the Nutribun program mm -hmm. that normally feeds people cost of 200 million. They scrap it and the money disappear. The former Minister of Education had to resign and is now being looked into for a court battle and so on. These are real things taking place in front of us in a country where but education is so valuable mm -hmm. and so many people are poor and need this lunch money, need this Nutribun, need this Nutrimilk. And the Ministry of Education is now being investigated for alleged stealing of it. So so it's why, not about why what the opposition... Why, why didn't the opposition know it a little earlier then? You we know? didn't know. Oh, Remember, okay. you know, we are not there running the accounts of the Ministry of Education. Mm -hmm. As soon as it was brought to our attention, notice it came to the fore and notice he had to resign. Mm -hmm. And that is the difference between us and them. But, all right, so I love the, I love the fact that you're saying this now and we're going back to um, Lee Kuan Yew's um, statements, or, or his actions rather. Do you think that we have the wherewithal and we're talking about um, both government or opposition now to sufficiently stamp out corruption because we know that corruption contributes or detracts rather from our GDP um, to some good percentage, more than 5%, all right? Jamaica is not the only country who no. has corrupted officials. And you know? we have been doing better um, because when you look at the corruption index, we have been doing better um, than subsequent, well, than the previous years. So we still grade very low mm -hmm. on the corruption index. And when you run a regression of yeah. corruption and productivity, corruption, no matter the size contributes negatively to the productivity of such a great I nation. I wanted to clarify that so that, that the regular man can understand Listen, what you mean when you say that. If you read my book, the second chapter looks at factors that contribute towards productivity growth, both labor and total factor productivity, which is mm -hmm. output per person or output per person mixed with machine, All the right. total output. Now, what we've realized is that when we see a fall in productivity is whenever we see an increase in corruption and that's fundamental because there is a negative relationship between productivity and corruption and, corruption. and if we want to increase productivity we, have to, we have to substantially reduce corruption in this country so so from an economic point of view though, what are some of the factors that contribute to, to that corruption of which you speak in economics there's always a saying there's non cessation of wants where mm -hmm. more is preferred to less so you always have had people who 
think that because they have access to other people's money, mm -hmm. it is theirs and it is wrong. And that is something that we have to really look into and take a stance because the government's budget is not for the politicians. And they made that mistake, oh, I'm not giving this person my money to spend, and it's not their money. So well, they have it in their brain that it's their but money. That, that's but just one not, person, you know. That's, what I mean? And, and, and I don't think that he speaks to... Of a collective of people. He's just representing their view. And it came out by accident. But, but that, that's, swinging, that's swinging wide, though, you know. We, no, we, we don't want because, to be unfair in our, in our statements. it's not being unfair. It is the political philosophy of these people. All right. They empty the coffers with shovels and buckets and dumper trucks. And there is no concern as to getting this money to serve the real purpose that they were intent to serve because they believe it's theirs. So looking at, looking at Mark Golden's presentation, um, he made some statements about, about GDP, well, about taxes being increased. So we have not had any new taxes um, for the past 78 years, but we have had, he says that there has been an increase from about 24 to 28% of GDP that's coming from taxation. What are your views on that? Yeah, I think that now the government is operating more efficiently. So my own view as an economist, when I look at those taxation, I would mm -hmm. say the government is operating more efficiently. So it's that a matter of efficiency. They are and, getting and more people in, in, the tax, in the tax net that so were once not there or were able to evade in some instances. Oh, because what so, he has stated, you know, he, mm -hmm. the, the impression that was given is that more Jamaicans are being taxed. Yeah, um, but it's true. More Jamaicans so, so and more people hand, are being dragged but then, into tax But then net. you don't want to give the impression that it means that it's harder because more Jamaicans are, are paying tax. No, how, how I analyze it from an economic standpoint is that that is what we've always wanted. We've always so, wanted to get more people to in To grow the, tax the formal net. economy. To, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So that, that's the approach. And when I analyze it as an economist, that's how I look at it and that's how we interpret what has been happening in that case. Uh, all right, because we're winding down to the end of this particular segment, um, we just want to get your views. So how do you rate the presentations, though? You have seen three presentations so far. You have seen um, Nigel Clark's, uh, Dr. Clark's presentation. We've seen Mark four. Bullen. Um, well, I've seen three. You've seen three, yeah. There was and the one Julian, by Dr. Julian Clark. Robinson. There was Julian's so, presentation. Oh, those were Mark Golden's presentation. Mm -hmm. and, and then that one from the so government. So we have seen the Honorable Prime Minister, um, we have seen the leader of the opposition, we have seen um, Julian Robinson, and we have seen Nigel Clark. So that's four now. Yeah. What are your assessment of them overall, and how do you grade them, any of them? Yeah, I think there is a political chess game at play between both parties trying to get their views in, trying to get their political inclination and their own ability to move the country forward. From the government standpoint, you realize that there have been little sweets, drop and nuggets, drop, drop here and there, drop, drop here and there. And also, you realize that they are trying to provide incentives for people to look at what they want to do. But fundamentally, and you'll see this coming out in Mark's speech as well as Julian, we continue to operate in a low-wage, low-growth economy mm -hmm. that is not benefiting a nation of such remarkable people over the long term. And this is what we ought to see. We ought to see plans being put in place, one, to stabilize water in a profound way, not just to say, oh, we're investing in this, we're investing in that, but as I say, the implementation, the building out of dams and storage and, and mm -hmm. catchment for, to, to stabilize agricultural output when there is drought, and to so, stabilize agricultural but, output when there's flood. So my argument then, you know, as, we, as we work to, to, to build out what you have stated, we have to say kudos to the government now because there's no new taxes for the past, what, seven, between seven and nine years now? Yeah, but Jamaica has been on that part with the fiscal rules, you know. Mm -hmm. The fiscal rules have in it a overall economic management framework that puts the country in a better position to become more efficient as to how the government manages its, its affairs. So the whole idea of no new taxes, they were coming because of the foundations that were laid from day one. So ah. what I would want to give the government commendation for mm -hmm. is if I see them trying to put the country on a sustainable long-term developmental path, 
to, if the government had achieved the five in four that they hypothesized, growth, five percent growth in four years, or even five in ten, or five in eight, then I would be here praising them. But we continue to grow at the average rate. And since the fallout of COVID, now yes, we're growing by 2%. But what is 2% growth when Guyana is growing upwards of 5%, 10%? Note what is 2% growth no, there when has been we a shift need in to accomplish outlook. our Vision 2030 goals and we need per capita income to increase by a thousand US dollars per year? Mm -hmm. And we needed to have seen those plans where we are looking to create a wealthy economy, an economy designed on wealth creation rather than job creation. All right, Dr. Dr. Horton, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you. Um, this has come, this, we're now at the end of this particular discussion, but we're definitely going to have you back Yeah, we here. need a part two. Um, we, we need, need a part, part two. two. Thanks for, for having this. me. So, and thanks for giving us the ability also to speak on these issues and to see where the budget has been coming from, as well as where Jamaica has been coming from and where we need to go. All right, so continue to stay with us as we go to our break. We will be having public affairs commentator Horace, well, sorry, <laughs> let me say Kevin O'Brien, Kevin O'Brien Chang shortly. So continue to stay with us. This is Kwame Thomas and you're watching The Conversation. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the conversation. We are now going to move a little further into our assessment of the national debates as they have been going. And for this aspect of the discussion, we're going to have public affairs commentator Kevin O'Brien Chang. Welcome to the conversation. Thanks How are for you? having me, Chief. So, yeah. just before just before we went to to this break, we had um, Dr. Andre Horton mm -hmm. on set and. He was looking at some of the, the inconsistencies in, in what has been happening in terms of the budget debates and what he would have expected. Um, more statements or more talk should have been had as it relates to moving the country forward in a sustainable way. Um, and, I, and I'm keen to remember the whole idea of him saying sustainability. Um, but then I want to, after you have looked at your own assessment of all four debates that have been take, that has taken place, I want to hear now of the, the fact that the Prime Minister has moved or sought to move the minimum wage from 13,000 for a regular person and for industrial security guards from 14,000 to 15,000 now per week for 40 hour a week. What are your assessment of that? Let's get a historical context. Minimum wage started in 1980. Yes, it was what, $26? $26, $26, but if it, the purchasing power is 100, mm -hmm. right? You know, you adjust for inflation and movements, it's 100. Right? Um, it fell to as low as 37 in 1990, roughly. And up to 2020, the last 10 years, it bounced around about 80. Yeah. Right? And in 2020, it was about 82%. 80, 80, roughly 80. Yeah. It's real purchasing power now is 125. So 80 to 125 is 50% increase that. All right? You go from 80 to 120, that's 50%. Mm -hmm. And it's 125 now, started off at 100. So this is 25% higher. In real terms. In real terms than any other time in Jamaican history. So, so it's this also 15,000 Translate to about 97. Roughly, roughly 100 US. Oh, well, for purchasing right. power parity. R yeah. rough, roughly 100 US, 97, we call it 100. And I can guarantee, tell you, for the longest time, it would have been a dream for Jamaica to have a minimum wage of 100 US. Yes, people in the US might, it, it might seem small, if you're in the U.S., but in Jamaica, you've always looked up and said, I mean, this, this, I, as I said, I posted that Winston Churchill had a thing after a battle of El Amin in World War II when Britain was losing and then won a, a, a battle. So this is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but maybe it's the end of the beginning. <laughs> and for Jamaica to achieve 100 U.S., roughly, minimum wage per week is a landmark for Jamaican history, I can tell you. As I say, you look up, I mean, we're way down, you know, we're down in the valley. And you look up to the 
up the, to reach the hill. And you say, but that would be a first step. There's plenty of other steps to go, you know. But to even reach that step is a huge accomplishment. So what would be your assessments now of, of all four debates um, so far? Two of them? All four presentations. Two of them were filled with facts and figures. And two were rhetoric. So two facts and figures, two rhetoric. You want to you want to parse that a little bit more to tell us who's who's were filled. Well, you know, this thing to them, objectively, you know, the Nigel Clark's budget. There was a wall of figures and also uh what do you call it? Game plan. Mm -hmm. So this is where we are. This is where we want to go. And he mentioned that the, the, thresh tax, the thresh income tax threshold. And he said if we are at 1.5 now, if we go to 2, this is how much it's going to cost us. If we go to 2.5, this is how much it's going to cost us. If we go to 3, and to go to 3 million, it's 45 billion it would cost us, right? So, so he didn't only give you the f figures and facts. He gave it a lot, the thinking behind their decisions. So look, if we did this, when cost us that. Said at three million, some people are suggesting three million, forty-five billion. Can we afford that? No. And he said, okay, we'll do one point seven. That's nine billion. We can afford nine you billion. You don't think that was a little conservative though, in terms of the nine the nine billion or what is it? Two hundred thousand. Listen, when it comes to Nigel Clark, he is unquestionably in my view, for a numerical grasp of the figures a mastery of the numbers, he has had no equal in Jamaican history. He's a PhD in math from, uh, from Oxford. I would expect no less. So I, look, I have a little MBA and little knowledge of finance and all that. Would I put my knowledge of finance and numbers up against Nigel Clark? No. Do I trust Nigel Clark has the numbers under control? Yes. Seven budgets or nine budgets in a row, or he has given, said it, seven. No new taxes. The debt has plummeted. Inflation under control. Unemployment is record low. Am I going to challenge Nigel Clark's numbers and facts? Based on he, he has his, he has a record of performance. He tells me as how it go. I believe him. But we just had we just had um, Dr. Andre Houghton here, and uh, he he stated or he lamented rather the whole idea of low tech, low wage economy, and he's saying that that is not sustainable. Um, but you're saying that we're seeing more jobs, but. Combining both of your points now, it seems as though there is a fall off in terms of quality jobs, not quantity. Who says what that? are your views on that? Who, who said that? Well, if we're having low, if, if what he's yeah, saying is a well, well, hold on. Mm -hmm. If you have a wall of unemployment, Jamaica, we used to 10, 15, 20 percent, you know. If you did 10, 10 years ago, so Jamaican unemployment rate gave me 4.2 percent. Lower than Germany, lower than Britain, lower than Canada. People say you're dreaming. 4.2 percent for Jamaica? We know it's a 10, 15. This is a fantasy. So the, this number is an incredible achievement. And if you're taking up people who weren't working before and bringing them into the system, you're going to tell me that's not a good thing? And we know. I don't listen, get that I, he's saying it's not a no, good thing. No, but we are, listen. Mm -hmm. Then like a rocket science. I think he's know. saying that the quality of jobs, that's where the issues are because then it's then a low yeah, tech, a low wage. Well, before that, there were no jobs. Quality mm -hmm. or no. Listen, I, as a businessman, I tell you, in the 90, I tell people all this time, in the 1990s and 2000s at Fontana, when that time when I had maybe three stores, university graduates would come to me, come to us, ask for jobs as store clerks. They couldn't get any job at all, university graduate. We would tell them gently, sorry, you know, you're overqualified, you're not going to stay with us and all that. So people who are talking about their quality of jobs now, their memories are very short. There was no jobs available. 2007, the JLP with Bruce Golding, that their ads, young people don't realize it. Their big thing was jobs, jobs, jobs. Young people wanted jobs, could not get jobs. Right? The jobs are there now. They start, you know, it's a ladder, you know. If you're not on the ladder, you can't move the ladder. But once you get on the first rung, you can't move up. So your job may not be the greatest, but once in the system, you can move up. And you're going to tell me those who have jobs now and didn't have job before, quality may not be great, aren't glad to have the job. They could decide not to work. If they didn't want a job, they don't have to take it. So the logic of the job quality not being the best is a, a foolish one because everybody knows Jamaica is still a poor country. We still need higher, more productivity. Our education system is improving. We all know that. You forget when Omar Davis back in the past, finance minister talked about the um, 
unem unemployables and the redeemables. You forget that. Saying that there's a certain segment of Jamaica will never get into the system. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, people's memories are short. So where we have reached now, as, as I said, back to Churchill, it's not the end or the... the, 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 the it's the not the beginning of the end. It might be the end of the beginning. The end of the beginning. And I say that you know, we're getting people on the ladder. People before that never so, had any access to the ladder. They get on the ladder now. Yes, they can start moving up. And we all know it doesn't have rocket science so, know the job's quality has to improve. So, so but you, you got to start somewhere. So, so, so the people are saying that. They say we mm -hmm. mustn't start nowhere. So, so, irrespective then, so irrespective of what um, Dr. Harton and others like you him might be somewhere. saying is that you are pretty much saying that That's at the, least they, we have started. They are the man who started at the top of the ladder. Don't that make any sense to you? OK. You, you see a ladder there, the wall there, so them say, the man get on the ladder. No, and them, them, they, must, they must be up there. How do rather them reach up there if they don't start down there? So Magically, they must fly to the top tell of the me, ladder. Tell me about, it's not logical. Tell me about um, the opposition leader's contribution, um, or response, rather, in, in terms of the presentation. How did you find it? Um, was there substance? Um, what could have been better? Um, all I can say is, let me put my word delicately, you have to wonder if they were seeking excitement deliberately. Why would you say that? Yeah, were the facts lacking that I have? And so I can create distractions. Was that, the, was that the point? I don't know. Was there any particular instances, though, that you, you could actually say that he was looking for a distraction as opposed to presenting facts? Well, I don't facts? know. I wasn't hearing more substance. So, because... I I, as I say, I, the only substance I can remember is about three, mi the three million threshold. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's puzzling, you know. Nigel Clark made the point only 30% of Jamaicans earn more than 1.5. So the threshold is only affecting 30% of those paying tax. Let us say half of Jamaica, working Jamaicans are actually in the system. Half of 30% is 15. So only 15% of Jamaicans would be affected by increasing the threshold. So that the 85% are not affected by the threshold. And yet that's the only thing you're bringing to the table. I said, is that good politics? Why am I focusing on only 15% of Jamaicans here? My big, if I listen to the opposition leaders, the beta or, or thing. My his big thing is three million, which costs forty-five billion, but that's only fifteen percent of Jamaicans been affected. Mm. So, so you're I'm, it's I'm, good, I'm, it doesn't make good financial or economic sense. It doesn't make good politics. So because I'm only I'm only the eighty-five percent who are not up there, I'm not affecting them. So if they're here, we're moving the threshold up. But under one point five already, how does that help me? We're not even in the system. How does that help me? So that I'm puzzled as to why you would make that your flagship issue when it doesn't affect 85% roughly of, the, of um, Jamaicans working. All right, tell me about it's the statement. It's a puzzle. The statement that was made, um, he, he stated that under, under the Jamaica Labour Party, you have seen an increase um, of tax to GDP where it was 24% um, four years ago, and now it's 28%. But um, the impression that would have been given is that more persons are being taxed no, but um, it was painted. are working. It, Unemployment is 4.2 percent. Mm -hmm. All the people who weren't in the system now in the system. So, you know, must have more people so to tax. Is it a good thing? Is 4.2 percent unemployment a good thing? Is, 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 is um, more tax revenue mm -hmm. a good thing? When so, nobody is paying, when in the, no individual is paying more taxes. The individual, as an individual, no individual is paying more taxes as a percent of their pay right now. Nobody pay. If I'm earning $100, uh, as a, as a, the percentage of my money going to government has increased. No. Mm -hmm. Individually, there's that, no Jamaica in the last seven years. Their tax, their, their percentage of money I'm earning pay, to pay into tax has gone up. No, I'm paying less tax. But the country as a whole is collecting more tax. So How can that be a good thing? If you don't collect tax, how are you going to fix road and fix water? But the critical point is the individual is not paying more tax. The system is generating more tax. So, well, the individual is having less tax burden, which is what you want. So, so, so that is what you pretty much any any economist so would say that is the situation you want, where the individuals pay less tax, pay less tax but collectively, but the government you're, you're collecting more tax to spend on infrastructure. So that you're is, saying that is what this is actually a good move then. But that's a goal. All right. The goal is less taxes for the individuals and more, taxes more collective, for the collective taxes to spend on infrastructure. So, so, so when we come back after, I mean, our... people have to understand. You know, you yeah. cannot pay, you cannot build roads and 
get water without, without taxation or borrowing. But if, yeah, but, well, if you're going to borrow, you're going to cost more without mm -hmm. more taxes. And the point, but in the point is, are the individuals complaining I'm overtaxed? No, they're paying less tax. So that is the ideal you want. That is a goal everybody strives for. Less individual tax, more collective taxes to spend. It's All not right. rocket science. So, so Anybody argues otherwise is economically illiterate. So we're, we're, we're going to go for our final break. And when we return, we will look at, we will look at a number of things. But mm. primarily, we want to look at the, <clears throat> how, much, how much substance now, not, not for the opposition leader, but for Julian Robinson when compared to um, the prime minister's speech as well as, <laughs> as, well as the, 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 the finance I'm minister's speech. I'm going to ask you, Dylan, what, what you remember from Mr. Julian Robinson's so, speech. As a, as a journalist who follows this close, I'm going to ask you, so give me something you remember from it. We'll, we'll come back with it right <laughs> after the break. Continue to stay with us. We go for a final break. You're watching the conversation. I'll be right back. Welcome back to the conversation where I'm speaking with public affairs commentator Kevin O'Brien Chang. So just before the break, we wanted to get your assessment of, of um, Julian Robinson's presentation. Um, but then while we were on the break, you started talking about a number of things. Um, Integrity Commission report. Well, one of the things that the Juliet Holness was accused of by the opposition holding back reports, not tabling reports from the Integrity Commission. And there's a statement today from the Integrity Commission. All Integrity Commission annual and investigative reports submitted to Parliament for tabling have been tabled. This accusation that Julia... Julia it's Holness, no, null and void. It's null and void. And they... they, I, they when Mr. Golding raised the question about her, her own integrity, mm -hmm. that she's not fit to serve, she's biased and all that, they didn't put any evidence that she's biased. Is it I, that they I, didn't put any evidence or they didn't create enough context to say why she's biased? Uh, as I say, where's the evidence? Mm -hmm. Where's the evidence that Juliet Holness has been biased in her handling of as Speaker of the House? She was Deputy Speaker, deputized a number of times, three and a half years. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever accused her of bias. And I would say Mr. Golding is the first person to, to um, argue that she has been biased. And one of the whispers by the opposition that she's holding back report, integrity commission reports should have been tabled. She's not tabling them. The integrity commission today says that is nonsense, officially. So if you're going to say somebody is biased, show me the money. And as I say, most people I talk to, they, Ms. Holness has been very stern, right? Restrict. School, ma school, ma'am, you know, this, so, um, and and um, most people like that. They said that they're, they're so, bringing the, the, that should bring in the school picnic them under control, like a good teacher, because they so, act like school picnic sometimes. So, 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 so. And she's also said uh -huh. the legislation has been tabled where they will have more say, the parliamentarians. She said it publicly, mm -hmm. but until then, she's going to abide by the current rules as she should. So, so my question now, in light of what you have just said, um, the statement have been made that she's unfit to be in the position that she's in because of but spousal she, relations. But she was seconded. You know, they, what they, are your views when there? When she was nominated, she was a wife then. She'd been a wife for 20 some years. <laughs> She'd been a wife since she became prime minister. Mm -hmm. All of them, Mr. Paul Will, all of them said they have no problem and they gave speeches afterwards. Say we welcome you and hope you do a good job. Dr. Phillips, Peter Phillips said, I came specially to see your um, uh, elevation, right? Angela Brownberg came in a speech later, we support you. So all these people now attacking her, they are on a record, videotape record, it's there. You, you know, you're going to believe me or your lion eyes, right? But I say, no, your lion, the eyes are there showing it. So what all of a sudden has made her unfit? She was the wife then, suddenly she's unfit because she's the wife. What has happened? You're saying it's hypocrisy? I said, let people draw their own conclusions. If I said this publicly when she was, uh, was elevated, and now I'm saying different, please explain yourself and show us why you've changed your views. You said she's hold, hold, holding back reports. The Integrity Commission said no. 
Has there any, been any accusation of her bias when she lets them speak on who not speak? Has she been following the rules? As I said, anybody can talk. But I respect people who talk with evidence. People who talk without evidence, I tend not to respect them. All right. So it sounds now that you are beginning to question the, the integrity or the credibility of the opposition. That's what it sounds like. As I said, there's a famous saying, who are you going to believe, me or your lion eyes? So, all right. So, so speaking of, of... I believe what mm -hmm. I see and heard, what I've seen and heard. I'm not, I don't believe my, my makeup things. I like facts on the table. And I saw the facts of people seconding, co recommending, congratulating. Mm -hmm. And no quarrel or no accusation for bias after and all of a sudden. Now today, she's unfit. What has made her unfit? So moving from that, and we're looking at the different things that, that the prime minister and um, the finance minister have tabled, and then you're comparing that against what Julian Robinson, in his defense, are res response me, as you're well a, as a professional hold on, journalist, hold on, hold on, as well as what Mark Golden has stated um, in in his response as well. And what I'm trying to to pull from it is that what would have been your expectation of the opposition individuals in their responses to what has already been tabled? What would have been well, your expectation? Well, I'm going to say this. You play cricket, and the team bought first and put up 500 on the board. Right? Mm -hmm. Give me a tough response. What do you do? I play it conservatively, don't say much, and make it slide. Right? Would I go out there licking, licking ball and trying to score runs when it, I'm way behind? And possibly get ball out for, for, for 100? So I would have played it very conservatively and not said much. So would you I'm say I'm going to ask you what, mm. did you, what do you remember the professional journalist Kwame from Mr. Julian Robinson's no, man, speech? No, no, no. I'm no, asking no, you to follow the news I mean, closely. No, man. So, so. so Julian basically played conservatively, mm -hmm. didn't say much, but maybe still didn't lose his wicket. But your, your argument is that that's what he should have done. So he has well, been what, doing what well, he's what supposed do to be do? doing. As but I then, said, Nigel Clark then, mm -hmm. put together... As I said, the numbers are all there. The alternatives are all there. Where was the opening for the bowler? Not much of an opening. Say bowl conservatively. Say don't get too much lick runs, lick off. So I would have played it very conservative, not said much because, to be honest, I couldn't find much of a critique in Nigel Clark's budget. But but as 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 opposition though, do you think that they ha they they have the liberty of not saying um, but listen, as much? An opposition, you know, mm -hmm. a responsible opposition. The job is. A watchdog. If I see something wrong, I call you out. I call you out. No, you're that wrong, that wrong. If I don't see nothing wrong, what do I say? And Nigel Clark's budget, listening to it, I listen to the entire thing. It is very difficult for me to question anything you said, especially, I tell you one thing, that that's a lot of work. When I listen to Nigel Clark's budget and Andy Warner's budget, that's a lot of hard, mental, diligent work. Hours and hours spent crafting that thing, so, right? It's a lot of work, and it's like, as I said, to, to see anything wrong with it, I said, me, you go challenge that, about the man them saying how much hours at work, and get all the numbers right, and show the alternative. If we do this, if we do that, I could not to critique. So, so, so looking at this, looking at it from, based on what you have said now, mm. um, I remember also that the opposition leader, he stated that we're not just about balancing books. We're also about balancing people's lives. And that I think that plays into the statement that has been made um, much earlier, where there's not enough. The man on the ground is that, not necessarily that, that, feeling but, but, but the, the changes budget, that are being made. Yesterday's budget, mm -hmm. the, the Prime Minister said that. So we're, balanc we're balancing the books and the people. And he said we listened. He accepted that. And the biggest takeaway of the budget yesterday for me, I've never heard so many towns and district and village naming ever called on a budget. We hear this district, that district, district, district. Another them words, you know, can get road and water. Mm -hmm. The big thing I ever get about the budget, all the little places we go to, or whatever. You no know, get road, you no know, get water. And it listed how much money. This is how much money we spend on the road, how much money we spend on the water. This was definitely the most detailed budget I have ever heard in terms of covering the island. Last year's budget, I remember, a lot of grand announcements Mr. Holness made. This one was a nuts and bolts budget. We're given a road, we're given a water. Yes, the minimum wage was there in the NHT, 
and the one for the, the, the heart, heart and the trust. whole programs, those are long term. But the average Jamaican, what they want? What they want is blocking road over. When Jamaicans block road, there's always two things, you know. We want water, we want good road. And this budget is clearly positioned there. And anybody who listened to the budget yesterday and it's a budget for the rich, they could not have been listening. It was very much a common man budget on the ground, little village, them, little town, country places. Because I said, the mountain near me here, I mean, obviously, but hundreds of little places here, this little place and that green hill, and we heard hundreds but of little towns so that nobody ever hear about it. As a, as a, as a businessman, though, mm -hmm. um, and, and we're backtracking, because we definitely want to tie down, we're trying to tie down the whole changes in terms of the minimum wage movement, um, the threshold movement, because it's, it's mulling in my head, and I'm seeing where, for example, the minimum wage, it, it tantamounts to $200 extra per day. Mm -hmm. um, that's roughly one way and, and a taxi, and a, and a, yeah, mm -hmm. and a road taxi. Um, do you think that it could have been a little better? Um, that's one, because, and I'm juxtaposing coming, that. Look where you know, it's coming from, I'm boss. It's no, 80%, the last Don't, it's don't it's tell me about where it's coming know. from, you know, because what we're looking yeah, but, at but, now, but, you know. But Kwame, we want to compare Kwame, that now. It's more better than less. <laughs> it's more better than no, less. No, more is always better than exactly. less. Exactly. Yeah. So the argument is, so, no, what, but, how much increase you want? You want to go from... No, um, that's what enough? I want to hear from you. 8,000, what is it? 8,000 or something? Mm -hmm. With the 13,000. Go to 13,000, no, it's 15,000. So it's technically... As I said, the ladder, the people on the ladder are moving up. But when you want to get on the first rung and say, must jump to the sky, you got to climb one by one. You think a man can just jump 20 foot up and go to the top of the ladder? How is that logical? <laughs> In a logical world, your first step, I want to get on the ladder. Mm -hmm. When unemployment was 15, 20%, half of the country was on the ladder. Only 4% are on the ladder now. And you're going to step by step. And people are saying, no, no, he, he mustn't go step by step. He must just jump 20, 20 step and jump to the top. Where's the logic? People ex really expect a magical movement in one year. So pretty much then, the opposition's um, requests or, or statements are, are unreasonable. That's, that's pretty much what you're illogical. indicating. Illogical. And illogical. Illogical. It's illogical for expect a man on the ladder, go on step one, step two, something jump to step 20. Yes, it is there, and we want to reach there eventually. And nobody's saying Jamaica reach, you know. It's still a poor country. Are we less poor than we were five years ago? The de I mean, who can question that we're not better off as a country? The, the numbers are there. The, the, the debt is down. The unemployment, unemployment rate is down. Overall, as a country, we're better off. Is everybody feeling it? Clearly not. And yesterday's budget was clearly that. You're going to feel it when you get water and you get road. You're going to feel life is going to go better. It's a budget. It's about, as I said, the goal of a government is to improve the quality of life of uh, everybody in the country. That, that is the goal. I am going to improve everybody's life. So, so in the, not only the rich, but also the poor. And the quality of life improvement for the poor, their biggest quality of life improvement they want, as they have said over and over again, we want better road, we want reliable water. So as we, and as that, we, was the, that was the focal point of that budget mm -hmm. yesterday from my point of so view. So as we move now into, into, well, closer to the end of, of today's program, what I want to get from you now, um, so you are saying that this is a step in the right direction. Now, what are your expectations going forward of both the government as well as the opposition in terms of the presentations that they'll have and, and the implementation of the policies that, are, that they're now um, proposing on both ends? Well, as I say, I expect from the government more of the same. I expect the debt to keep coming down. I don't much lower the unemployment can get, right? The balance of payments for the first time in, since 1966 is positive. Think about that. The first time last year since 1966, Jamaica has taken in more money than it paid out. Think about it. 34 plus 24, 58 years. No, we want it to continue. As I say, we want everybody on the ladder now to climb further up the ladder. That must be all of our goal. And Anybody who thinks that 4.2% unempl unemployment and 70% debt, debt to GDP ratio, the lowest in 30 years, that's supposed to be the lowest in 50 years, right? A positive balance of payments, right? Record 
minimum wage in terms of the purchasing power. If these are not good things, then what are good things? What would we want? What, what would we consider good if these aren't good things? And as I said, people are going to say, I'm a labor writer, I'm a government spokesman, and all that. I'm simply stating the facts and figures. These are good facts and figures. It's stating good facts and figures makes so, it biased. Then what the hell? I must, I must make, create fantasy figures to show. So, so well, in what the, we are, in, I, my in, point is, Virginia Maker is on the ladder. Mm -hmm. Get more people on the ladder. You saw the hope thing, the children and the pain, and they're going to give tools, allowance for hard people get more people on the ladder, and keep them climbing up the ladder. That must be our goal. And the opposition, no, yeah. their goal is that there's something wrong, critique it. Or if you don't like the government, they come with a better idea. But come with the facts and figures. Don't just tell me something. I'm going to do the three million threshold. What's the cost? Why do you think it's a good idea? Come with logic. That's all I'm asking from an opposition. Come with logic. And yes, the government, all governments will go off track and chat foolishness, and some corruption will happen. Hold them to book. That's your job as your majesty's loyal opposition. But come with logic with facts. and facts and figures. Don't come to me with fantasy, made up numbers, and then no justification. No, why should I? I, have, I am a believer in evidence-based decision making. So if you're going to tell me you're going to make a decision, show me the evidence. Nigel Clark has done that. That is what nobody can say he didn't show that. And the whole is giving me things that I assume Angel Clark has checked off, right? So I, the dream, my dream of dream maker has always been this. The education system is where we need to shift and change. Mm -hmm. I would love to see us have, we are a very vibrant, we have things in Jamaica, nobody else, few people have, you know, the natural vibrancy, the laughter, the joyousness. But we have, we're poor and we have economic divide. I'd love to see us reach a point where we're no longer poor, we don't have the economic divide. So I put this with Scandinavian economy and social systems with West Indian vitality. That would be the best country in the world. Why can't we get there? All right. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Quite the bit, a bit, bit, a robust conversation between myself and Kevin O'Brien Chang. So he stated that he wants an evidence-based approach in terms of governance in Jamaica. So thank you very much for sitting and having the conversation Thanks for having me, no Kwame. Always enjoy the conversation. Yes. And thank you very much for staying with us. This has been The Conversation. I am Kwame Thomas. Continue to watch Scene TV, your preferred eye to the Caribbean. Have a good one. <laughs>